Hello and welcome to At The 55, your home for OUA football. Me and Tom are back on the mics with episode four of the Exit Meeting series, where this week we are breaking down my Guelph Griffins. <laughs> you heard that right. I am so excited for this. I took way more of Tom's time in our pre Odd preamble just to make sure every nook and cranny was right because I'm so excited. But we know all good at the 55 podcasts start off with these simple but powerful words. Tom Sterling, how the heck are you doing, my friend? <laughs> I am doing well, my friend. I am doing well. Seeing the grin on your face talking about these Guelph Griffins once again has just brought such a smile to my own, even though. I may have gone to another school. For those who are not watching on YouTube, I am rocking the Griffin logo, the Griffin shirt here today in solidarity with Zach and some very exciting news coming very out of the uh, Griffin's lair that we'll get into a little later on. So I am very excited to be talking about these Guelph Griffins, hearkening back to my own coaching days back in 2019, and I uh, can't wait to get into it. 1,000%. And you alluded to some of the dress wear we are sporting. Uh, if you are tuning in via YouTube, I have a few other physical props that will be for you, for our audio listeners. We love you dearly. You're how this thing all started. We'll do our best to describe the props when they come to pass. First one being, of course, that sound is my Yates Cup ring tapping the microphone. Tom. You know, we're here recording on January 28th. If you're listening to this episode, watching this video when it drops, it'll be around noon on the 30th is when this will release. And time of recording couldn't be more spectacular because we are coming off the eve of the Wildman Banquet Dinner. Now, I know you're very familiar with it. I'm curious, actually, to harken back to your time as a player at Mac, even if that was something that you were familiar with, maybe when you were getting recruited to Guelph, if they talked about that, because I wasn't a heavily recruited player. So I'm, I imagine this is probably part of the whole pitch. But certainly you're familiar with it from your time coaching with Guelph. For those who aren't, essentially, the Wild Men Award dinner is the end of your banquet for the football program. It recognizes players such as top rookies, offensive, defensive players, line play, MVP, and recognizing fourth and fifth year players, coaches, players based on their uh, involvement in the community, um, volunteers in and around the program, a number of other things. But it culminates in the top trophy, the Wildman Award itself. And just a few words just from the website itself, just because I'm sure in the process of this conversation, I'll explain through maybe talking about some of the previous winners what this award means from my vantage point. But just so you have the explanation from the Griffins themselves. The Ted Wildman Memorial Trophy goes to the senior or graduating Griffin player who best exemplifies the traits of sportsmanship, leadership, gentlemanly conduct, and who has kept their scholarship in good standing. The name of the trophy is of great importance to both the program and the and the school quickly on Ted Wildman. He graduated from the Ontario Agricultural College, the school that preceded the University of Guelph. The switchover was, I believe, 1964, the first year that Guelph existed as the University of Guelph. Um, so he was a popular figure on campus, showcasing his athleticism as both a champion wrestler and a star football player. About a year after graduating, the young man was tragically killed in a car accident while working for Canada Packers, Ted Wildman, the namesake of the Ted Wildman Memorial Trophy, once again, sort of the culminating trophy of all things the Guelph Griffin and the values the program believes in to the graduating or fourth year uh, senior player. Tom, we're here less than a day from this award happening. You're privy to a lot of those highlights. Why don't you kick us off? was sort of what's some of the, what are some of the, because there's a number of things, maybe some of the biggest things that caught your eye in coming off of this event. Well, first and foremost, in the first ever Wildman history, there was a shared Rookie of the Year award, and 100% rightfully so. The yep. honor was shared between one Marshall McRae and Tristan Abood. Both of these players absolutely showed some exemplary stuff for Guelph. And I think that there is a very bright future for them going forward here. Um, even 
you know, a couple of stats here. Tristan Abood in his first year was third in passer, uh, passer efficiency, third in completion percentage, and fifth in passing touchdowns in his first ever year in the OUA. And you and I have on multiple occasions gone through the list of elite quarterbacks that were in the OUA this past year. So to be in that conversation in a number of those categories says volumes about this young man. And then obviously Marshall McCray led the country with nine rushing touchdowns over 600 yards of total offense and was just the wild card for this Griffin offense every time they stepped on the field. So that's first and foremost, what really uh, stood out to me. What are your thoughts on those? Yeah, I was joking with you how uh, I had to venture on to Instagram to see what news Guelph posted about it and whether they had posted about some other things that I know we're certainly going to talk about very soon. That is, uh, you know, just got us both so excited. And the first thing I saw was the post about Marshall McCray winning the rookie of the year. And I didn't see that it was a co-rookie award. And I was like, that's bonkers because yes, you wrote, you read off the significant contributions that McCray made himself, the rushing touchdowns, very much kind of in that Jalen Hurtsy uh, vibe, often where they'd come in for he'd come in for short yardage, but also he was in that very uh, Miami Dolphins of you know ages past wildcat offense that they would run with him, and he would break off big runs too, and just him and a boot, and obviously that that um, Waterloo game in specific when a boot got hurt, and seeing him go in and just all the tools he has as a quarterback as well as a runner, but the sort of fire and ice of those two guys, it's really exciting to see that uh, that that project with two rookies worked so well. And the biggest hope I have is, I guess, yeah, I guess, yeah. Let's just talk about this. I guess we were kind of joking about how, do we start with the Wildman? Do we start with talking about twenty twenty three? But I guess we're just doing both at the same time. And I'll pass this back to you on this point, Tom, which was that like we've talked so much just as recently as with Nate on the show last week or the da, 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 yeah last week about the importance of having your guy at quarterback, having them get those reps, having them have the connection with the receivers, the running backs, have the cadence be familiar for the offensive line and just have their menta- mentality be sharp. I know this is my role. I know this is my responsibility. We seemingly are all in agreement with that. Do you? think and maybe they've shown maybe the proof's in the pudding but sometimes you go through one year one two three you start to feel like i'm that guy like i'm it is my team do you think that it's a sustainable model to have these two rookies who they have just recognized as their top rookies continue an offense where it's like yes you're both our starting quarterbacks in a sense here's your role and here's your role in the same way you might have a starting pitcher and then a closer and they both are in baseball and that's all part of how you get the win but your responsibilities are different and we're kind of changing almost the the definition of what we understand to be the quarterback position or does one of these guys eventually have to win it out i think there's a lot of room here for t- to have that potential of a two quarterback system in that regard i did like the way that they did it last year where marshall mccray would come in in certain key situations and then you know, especially there was a few times where McCray would come in on like a second and one and he'd do his standard, whether it was QB sneak or a run or something along those lines, and then he'd get it. And then to keep the defense on their toes, they go into hurry up and Marshall McCray stays in there and he throws a pass or he does something like that. And it just kind of changes the pace, changes the flow a little bit and makes sure that people have to stay honest. And it's one thing when you have because a lot of teams, especially in the U.S., there's a lot of teams that have this two-quarterback system, even just so that we do have an outright starter and then another guy who just kind of comes in and does some rushes, does some quarterback sneaks or whatnot. But Marshall McCray, I think, has so much potential. And even just last year, we saw a bit of that, but he's still, I feel, such a raw talent that if he receives the proper coaching and tutelage here, he could be a very special athlete. So, It's going to be very interesting to see how they manage this dynamic between the two of them. And a big part of this dynamic is going to come down to the two of them. How is Tristan Abood and Marshall McCray going to react to the shared time that's there? Because Abood has shown himself that he's able to run and and take off, certainly. Um, So how does things go like that? How are we expecting things? For those of you who don't know, Tristan Abood was also, in, I believe, a CJET player for uh, a few years as well. So he's had that experience of playing against a higher tier of football, and it showed in his passing game. Marshall McCray's fresh out of high school, and so I think of everything in his game, the arm needs to be a little bit more developed. I think he's got the cannon uh, for it. 
but I, I would like to see him just a little bit more accurate. And maybe that just means being put into situations where he's a little bit more accurate, but a long winded answer of saying, yes, I think it's possible, but it's going to take a lot of cooperation, both from the offensive coordinator, and especially between these two quarterbacks to continue the success that they had. I think that's a good breakdown of it. As a, an additional point, if you forgot Marshall McCray from the Niagara region, cousin of one Trey and Tyrell Ford. So football is in this young man's blood through and through. And you mentioned McCray's numbers as in the rushing, and they're incredible, right? To read them off again, 48 rushes, 418 total yards, nine touchdowns, and along a 33. Once again, to reiterate that he isn't just it isn't just as simple as him being the short yardage guy, though he definitely is able to take short yardage plays and break them out to the side for longer carries. Arguably just as impressive when we think about the input of a rookie. When you look at Tristan Abudin, you highlight he can throw it. He, pardon me, he can run it a little bit too. Um, scrambles 22 times for 176 yards. As a passer, as just a passer, he's arguably as impressive as what McCray did rushing the ball. Because when you look at those numbers in eight games, and the eight games, I believe, includes a Waterloo game where he gets banged up in it. They end up losing that game. And we'll definitely have to dive back into their year more thoroughly when it comes to wins and losses and just like the end of their schedule and how it all came to a head. Because like this was a team that at its finest looked like one of the most formidable teams in the OUA. But for Abood, in we'll call it properly seven and a half games, he gets injured in the eighth. He completes 119 passes on 171 attempts for just a tick under a 70% completion completion percentage rating, almost 1,500 yards in the air, 10 touchdowns, two interceptions. Uh, I don't really know. I've still yet to properly learn how to interpret the efficiency rating, but really strong. And we'll get to a guy who was recognized as one of their fourth, fifth-year guys, I believe, or sorry, I was going to bring his name up as someone who is still actually a third year guy in Genesis as his prime target. He was banged up a little bit this year, too, all the way of saying that like you have. And so once again, we've highlighted that McCray is not just a runner. He can. He has the talent, maybe needs to refine it a little bit. And Tristan Abood is this incredible passer and he can run it a little bit. Maybe you need to figure out one or the other, but you have two just phenomenal guys at what they do right now. So it's so exciting from that standpoint alone to look at the future of this team because we know the impact that the passing can have. And though this doesn't directly go back into the Wildman, or I think it does because I think this individual was their offensive player of the year and their MVP, I believe, rightly so, in a young running back who, much like with their quarterback, arguably isn't even their best Running back, do you want to take us in that direction in terms of who was honored, if my memory serves, in terms of the top offensive player and then as a result, top defensive player? Most definitely. So starting off offensively, because you led us into it so beautifully here, the offensive player of the year was Donovan Malloy. Heck yeah. Hugging 1,044 yards and five touchdowns. Donovan burst into the scene this season, emerging as the big play threat and workhorse carrier. That comes directly from the Guelph Griffin Instagram page. And most definitely, it's very rare that you find, or I shouldn't say rare, but it's very difficult, in my opinion, to be an explosive big playmaker at the running back position. You need to have unbelievable vision, speed, and strength, because especially if you're just getting handed the ball off in the backfield, you got to make guys miss. For sure, it comes down to the offensive line blocking as well. But in order to have that big play, you need to be able to get past run down the field, have these big gainers, it's much easier for a receiver to just beat some coverage and have a deep ball. But to have that in the running back position was really outstanding and was why he was named the overall MVP of the of the team as well. Um, what, like I said, 1,044 uh, rushing yards with just 117 carries, averaging 8.9 yards per rush. He was the second highest uh Yes, this put his yards per carry average second highest in all of U sports and the leader in the OUA. So that is a hell of a statistic, especially for a team that, like these Guelph Griffins, had so many options in the offensive backfield. We talked about Tristan Abood and Marshall McCray and all the, the great things that they did. To have him stand out and be the overall offensive MVP really goes to show how well this kid did. Question, Mr. Sterling? Yes, sir. Yes. 
Um, so we talked about how great a runner that Marshall McRae is as well. We're talking about how good Donovan Malloy is as well. Question, Mr. Sterling, who's the best running back on the Guelph Griffins? Ooh, that would be one injured player, Isaiah Smith. It just might be. It just might be. This is the crazy <laughs> thing. Talk about your boy, because we're hitting, you know, uh, like, obviously, you know, Tom, once again, if you're just tuning in uh, during for the audio, Tom is decked in the background with all his Mac gear. He's a champion from the Master Marauders. And, of course, there are a few teams that hate one another more than Guelph and Mac, but you spent time coaching in Guelph. But who we're talking about now, not just as former offensive linemen, I know we get excited talking about running backs because we know their success. It's really a product of our success. <laughs> um, but these are two guys, one in Malloy, who comes from the city you've adopted as your hometown, the school, the city where you went to school in Hamilton, and then a kid in Isaiah Smith from your actual hometown in Burlington, in the Golden Horseshoe, where you grew up and cut your teeth, becoming a young, excellent football player. Um, so I know this means a lot to you in a multitude of ways, talking about these two running backs they have. Most definitely. Um, Isaiah Smith in particular, being a Burlington Stampeder product, he was somebody I was really excited for uh, coming into this year. And obviously last year he was the rookie of the year for them and the OUA. Um, he really did some outstanding stuff. But when you were coming into this season and you were there in person, so you obviously got the chance to see him in his first game against Toronto. When you see pictures of this young man, Crazy. I hearken it back to like Saquon Barkley. And I don't say that lightly. This kid is so unbelievably strong. He's packed like a workhorse. And when he's healthy, I argue that he is one of, if not the best running back in the OUA. And so to miss him on their in this year was obviously a big blow for them. But Donovan Malloy stepped up like crazy. And then to think... And we'll get into this a little bit later on as well. But like next year, they'll have a Donovan Donovan Malloy who's got a year under his belt and the offensive MVP and overall team MVP for all of the efforts that he did. Isaiah Smith, who is arguably, like I said, one of the best running backs in the OEA right now. Marshall McRae, Tristan Abood, who can take off at a moment's notice here. There's really so many different options. We haven't even got to the receivers yet, like Vison Janusis and all of the capabilities that he's able to do. Uh, we've mentioned this before, but like this Griffin team, even just the past couple of years, last year they finished three and five. If they are a hundred percent healthy and they have all of their guys here, uh, like at least they're going six and two, at least I would argue per probably seven and one with all of the capabilities that they have here. But you know, you get into that woulda, coulda, shoulda. The point is the athletes are there. You just got to keep them healthy. 1000%. I mean, just yeah, you mentioning those names, Janusis being the veteran of that group, mm -hmm. and I think this is East West year. I think it's like mm -hmm. I feel like we should maybe go through some of those names and really like you know we talked about your guy Jackson Cooling a couple weeks ago, so I feel like they're the same class when we look at some of those star skill position guys that are going to be probably at East West. We should look into that a little bit. But you mentioned Isaiah Smith, and yeah, in that Toronto game before he goes down, which was seemingly on the first drive of memory serves, but even before then you just carrying the ball and just running guys over. And I just want to quickly, I mean, this is going to be a long podcast. I know that already. And it, <laughs> I, 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 so I'm just, I'm not even going to like try to like rain any like commentary that gets us a little bit distracted, but I want to go back to the game last year. One of the most fascinating games at the time. And I think as we've progressed from that moment, that's been, that's been so informative in looking at uh, being able to understand the big picture of both these teams. Well, which was Windsor going to Guelph, seemingly the, the Joey Zorn breakout performance where we're in week two of the 2022 season. So the year when Western beats Queens for the, the repeat Yates mm -hmm. Cup champion, they lose to Laval in their home court, and then Laval beats Sask in the Vanier in London. We all remember that year. It's not too far away. Week two, we have the matchup of Danny Skelton, of course, a familiar team with Windsor. But of course, then on the other side, Jake Helfrick, remember when us talking about him, one of the Americans yes. that came, or a Canadian that went to the States and then came back? I don't know. <laughs> Forget that story. He's not with this team anymore. Other quarterback, another guy is not with this team anymore. And Sean Law, we seriously cool. need to get him or his pops on this podcast to talk about <laughs> some of those times that he had with Guelph under Coach Sheehan. But in specific, we see in a losing effort because in this game, Windsor shocks seemingly the OUA world winning 28-24 
at Alumni Stadium in Guelph. But Isaiah Smith, the rookie, takes the ball for 13 attempts and nets himself 120 yards and two touchdowns. Of course, on the other side of the ledger, fellow rookie Joey Zorn takes the ball 18 times for 203 yards, one touchdown. Christopher John adds in uh, 45 yards on nine touch on nine carries as well. And part of the reason I bring this game up, not just to highlight another performance, just that one performance that Isaiah Smith came onto the map for us. But once again, it's an incredibly instructive game. Now, you know, almost two years, a year and a half after the fact, because of all the other information we've received, because we can now say, well, on the one hand, yes, we know that that running game for Windsor is legit, but we also know with an ample number of other games to support this, that that Guelph rush defense over the last couple of years was very poor. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, that's worth taking into account. But then on the other hand, when you look through that defense for that Windsor team, we're still seeing names like, uh, do you remember Kaladia Moosin? Move to Ageli. They're still in that defense. Mm -hmm. Guys like Bretton McDougal, guys like Liam Hoskins, Maceo Christmas, Andrew Beatty, all these guys. That's a great Windsor defense. So mm -hmm. just once again, if you forgot about Isaiah Smith, which is fair because essentially he didn't play this year, he goes along, Donovan Malloy, not just their top runner and the guy that they recognize as their top offensive weapon, but a guy that, as you said, ranked amongst the top in youth sports, going along those two quarterbacks and Vishon Genusis as we enter 2024. Let me pause there because I just I just said a lot of words. Tom, just take over. <laughs> yeah, and just as a bit of an exclamation point on exactly what you said, in that 2022 season, the end of the year stats, Windsor finishes with the fourth best rushing defense in the OUA, whereas Guelph finishes in dead last. So while the two between Joey Zorn and Isaiah Smith, we're going back and forth between each other. And we all know how high we are on Joey Zorn. I don't want to take anything away from him. I'm more so saying how impressive that showcase was for Isaiah Smith to come out against Windsor like that and to really showcase the capabilities that he has on this team, I think is just speaks to him very well. Uh, I know that we're spending a lot of time on this young man here, but I really do think that it's worth just talking about what the capabilities they have when he is back in there. I can tell you when he was at uh, the, the Stamps, not only was he the running back, whatever, he also had some quarterback time as well. And now it's not like I don't expect him to come in and say, oh, we're going to also get you to throw because they've got those two guys who are there. But more so, he understands the offense. He understands the capabilities and the like the uh, the working. So it's not just like another player just playing his position. I really think the world of this kid, and I think he's got a huge future in front of him. He's just got to stay healthy along with the rest of that Griffin team. Most certainly. And health is a great jumping off point to now look at some of the other aspects. Before we do, allow me just a moment's break to lean into some more prop comedy I have here because I'm getting a little cold over here, Tom. So I'm just going to put on this nice warm Griffin blanket we got here. Oh, <laughs> and you know what? In case the red cra clashes with the red I'm already wearing, you know, we can get the black Griffin blanket going here as well. It's a real cozy situation we have over here. My own little Griffin lair once again. If you're only tuning into the audio, my apologies for this mild digression as I now get nice and warm as we dive into more hot news coming out of the Wildman from last night. But Tom, you mentioned injuries and we've been just going off about the offense of, of, of youth and, and productivity they've been getting out of those five names that we've talked about now. Uh, let's turn to the defense because another thing that the Wildman looks at, and we'll obviously look at who the team honored as their defensive player of the year, but the team also honors fourth and fifth year players, or I guess technically maybe sixth year players, but just senior guys, graduating guys. And when you go through those lists, and I think I uh, you know, expressed the concern, you know, don't bother writing down the whole list as I did because I eventually made a note on my page saying, uh, C website because the the list is pretty long and includes yes offensive players but a lot of defensive guys that are worth noting to begin with going back to last year and this ties in strongly with that injury bug that you talked about and we've already mentioned it obviously with Donovan Malloy a Guelph defense that finished fourth worst in terms of points per game at 26.8 and as we said a large part of that is when you factor in their rushing defense that was the second worst. And realistically, you just have to call it the worst because when York's in dead last, giving up 302, and then you're in 10th place at 204, 
it's, you know, what the hell are we talking about at that point? Teams like Ottawa is at, are at 190 and 9th. The top defensive rushing team is Queens, only giving up 102. So yeah, you could say it's kind of crazy to think that there's 100 yards separating 1 and 10, but 100 yards separating 10 from 11. I don't know what all that means, but a defense that was thoroughly banged up, not that strong last year, but I think once again, had a ton of potential when we look at some of these names. And obviously the coordinating piece was a little bit muddied up with just who was calling up plays when and where. But Tom, let's look at this defense. It wasn't that mighty last year, though. Defense is usually something Guelph hangs their hat on. But we've certainly seen the names that one might think this could be. And at its best, it did show to be a very strong defense. Oh, my God. This like. I can't get over talking about the potential that this team had and I think still has going into this year upcoming with just all of the injuries that were there. You know, you talk about how about who was defensively the most electric player that you saw when you were when you watched them play against Toronto the week 1. Anthony Mortuzo who gets injured. Yeah. <laughs> Brandon Farago, who is their uh, their starting middle linebacker, he gets injured. Scott Murray, they're all Canadian. He's injured before the season starts. And even what I want to really highlight as well, one in particular player I know very well because I was watching the game very closely, as I do with all of them, but especially this one, between Mac and Guelph, Javon Jacobson. I yeah, think your makes his first start. And or at least plays first on defense. I think he had an injury kind of coming into this and then played in that. In his first real game, he records 10 tackles. Mm. The dude was all over the field constantly, and he's a first-year player. He's from Burnaby, BC. So the, the capabilities for this defense, once again, are through the roof. One thing that I do want to mention is that while you were saying about the seniors, and there are uh, admittedly quite a lot, there's only a few that are actually in their fourth year of eligibility. True. So the guys in the fourth year, Kane Stevenson, Scott Murray, Simon Shabs, O.V. Smith, Akapene, Brandon Farrago, Spencer Kennedy, Josh Campbell, and Curtis Woodmansey. Those are very high-profile players for this Griffin team, don't get me wrong, but all of them have the capability to come back for at least another year, and everybody else on this Griffin team also has eligibility. There might be some guys who might be in their fourth or fifth year of school, but they can come back and play football. So that's another massive part of this. Technically speaking, they could bring back the entire team next year and still have all of the star power, all of the capabilities that we talked about as a potential. And hopefully they stay healthy enough to really utilize all of that because my goodness is this a damn good team on paper? It really is. I mean, yeah, you, you have to think that uh, a, a guy in Brandon Farago, who's uh, listed in his sixth academic year for a psychology degree. I mean, come on, brother. I did philosophy <laughs> at that school. <laughs> like six years is a lot as it is. I did four and a half. I mean, you, you know, get it together. But the guy is an absolute monster when he's on the football field. Um, Scott Murray, fifth year academic, right? That's a big loss for them. You're, you're, it's very, it's point taken that like in theory they can have all these guys back. But when we just go through a few of those names more in, in, in a little more specificity as far as fourth year eligibility, but fifth year academic, because if we're just going to say, is there a likelihood and, and all these things? And, you know, maybe the new coach factor is fascinating because if you are a guy like Scott Murray, you know, if you're going to come back for a sixth year of school, play your fifth year of uh, eligibility to, to finish up your time, what direction is the team going in? New coach, young core of the team. Are you just saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to start looking forward to the next part of my year, a uh, part of my career in my life. Josh Campbell and Curtis Woodmansey, pretty much the interior core of that defensive line, fifth year school, fourth year eligibility. Yusuf Al Khalidi, fifth year school, only third year eligibility. So it's kind of a moot point where it's like he's got two years technically to play, but he's in his fifth year. So, you know, at the most, you probably only get one more year, but who knows? Maybe with COVID guys are going more often into that that sixth year of eligibility or fifth, pardon me, sixth year academic. Um, Nicholas Parcheco, another fifth year um, mm -hmm. academic where once again, we're really talking about that defensive line and guys from that squad that might take a hit. Um, and then the last probably big fifth year uh, academic guy on this list, uh, not to disregard some of the other guys, but is Benjamin Lancaster mm -hmm. as well um, as just some of that offensive line depth. Um, 
Now, if we slide down a little bit into that fourth year eligibility, we talked about with, um, you know, looking at that offense of Sean Genesis being a third year player um, based on the eligibility. And we've said this a million times and we'll no doubt continue to say it until, I don't know, a whole new generation of football players where the COVID piece still makes all this stuff very confusing. But looking at guys who are in that fourth year eligibility um, and as well thinking about maybe some of the East West guys, though, that's less of a, a detriment. Guys like Scott Murray are also, and maybe guys like, say, Curtis Woodmansey are guys where also you might think, do they end up getting drafted? Are there any guys that really stick up, stick out to you in that fourth year group eligibility wise that we might not be concerned just because of the academic year, but also because another team at the CFL level might be picking them up? Well, I think when you start looking at some of the capabilities that these guys have who are all in their fourth year of that eligibility, uh, there are a few guys who really stand out as potentials that could go into the CFL. Um, Curtis Woodmansey, I think, has the capabilities. Obviously, his brother's currently the starting uh, right I sorry, left guard for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Uh, he was first round pick and did very well. I think Curtis has a lot of the same athleticism that his brother does. So he has the potential on that defensive line. I think actually somebody who might be a little slept on, but has that potential as well, in my opinion, is Kane Stevenson. Um, I loved his capabilities and all of the, uh, the versatility that he brings to that offense, starting off as a running back and then going into something of a slot receiver for them, showcasing his abilities to get open and make guys miss and then run over a couple of people because he still has that running back kind of background. I really love his capabilities there. And if nothing else, I think he's got great potential as a special teamer in the CFL that people are definitely going to be looking at because he has that athleticism as well. And then obviously you look at a guy like Scott Murray. It's a little bit more difficult when you're a Canadian defensive lineman uh, to crack that, but I think that he is, he has the tangibles. He's got the length. He's got the speed. He's got the strength. Um, I think if nothing else, the best thing is that if Scott Moore is serious about wanting to go to the CFL, I still think that he needs another year to come back and really prove himself when he's not injured at least. And uh, that might bode well for the Griffins, depending on what his future looks like and what he wants to do. But once again, I think that, while you could make the case for a lot of these guys, I think even if they were to get drafted, it would probably be in the best interest to go back for one more year and try their their last year of eligibility or just try to get a little bit more under their belt before really leaving here. Um, I think some of the younger guys like Vishon Genusis, we're definitely going to have that conversation next year about whether or not they could go. Um, but for right now, I think I think this Griffin team is in a very good position to reload with the guys they have and keep going. I think you're actually you're you're spot on. So then let's just move it a little back down the line from the fourth and fifth year guys, or sorry, the really the fourth year guys that we're just talking eligibility. I think you raise a good point with Kane Stevenson. And yeah, that versatility piece. Cause like I've always thought it's funny they haven't listed a receiver based on the roster I'm looking at. Some years he's listed at run he's been listed at running back, some years he's been listed at fullback, which just I think speaks volumes to the caliber of athlete he is. And obviously he's played in a number of different offensive systems when you think about the time he spent with Guelph. Let's dive into that third year, guys. Third mm -hmm. year group of guys. So now starting to think about as far as that picture into next year. And I think there's still some stuff we ought to talk about with last year too. We haven't done the full dissection, but since we're in this process right now, and maybe this will give us a, a jumping off point to do just that, thinking about guys that might be recognized in that East-West consideration and as you said who might be some of those draft guys we're talking about after next year we've mentioned Vishon Genesis's name another name who I think got recognized you might have it as far as Wildman award winners um, or, or uh, award winners at the Wildman last night um, in terms of Devin Cromwell mm -hmm. outstanding mm -hmm. sort of DB uh, Sam at the more probably more of a, a half I suppose Ethan Pyle Daniel Hosevar on the offensive line in terms of the mm -hmm. third year Cole Watson, not linebacking core for them. And yeah, like we said, Devin Cromwell, Malcolm James, another name who I think in that defensive back area, um, I'm trying to remember. I feel like we talked about him, but I just can't remember if it was for good or bad reasons. But <laughs> enough names off the jump right there. Obviously, Genusis, Cromwell, Cole Watson, Hosevar, and Pyle as third-year guys that are really and Jacob Thomas and Ryan Ogilvy as well. Shoot, Yusuf Al is a third year. My goodness. Mm-hmm. Wow, a really strong, not even to mention guys in that fourth year eligibility, four and five year in terms of academic year, a really strong veteran core that we still have here with Guelph. What do you think of some of those names that we mentioned? Well, yeah, absolutely. They are 
some of the heart and soul of this Griffin team. And I'm happy you mentioned Devin Cromwell because he was the defensive player of the year for these Guelph Griffins here. Just to go into a a little bit of a blurb that they wrote about him as a shutdown defensive back, Devin Mm -hmm. made his impact known throughout the 2023 season, resulting in 21 and a half total tackles, a forced fumble and an intercept uh, interception. And this resulted in him earning second team OUA all-star honors. I do think that it's worth noting that some of the, Whenever you are an all-star or whenever you are an unbelievable defensive back, your stats may not show it because teams stop throwing to you at times. I think a lot of those tackles that Cromwell was able to uh, manage are when he's chasing people down rather than when, you know, his man caught a ball on him. I really loved how this young man stepped up and did his thing on the defense that was like we said, loaded with potential and saw a lot of people who get who got injured. They still had a lot of guys who would come in and kind of do their thing. Obviously, Simon Shaves as well, um, doing his thing at the linebacker position and really, uh, well, ultimately winning the Wildman Award, spoiler alert for, for that. But you can see all of the potential leaders on this team, especially on the defense, and I really love what I'm seeing, especially in the the third year players. A lot of those guys that you named off are on the defensive side of things. I think as long as they have the right defensive coordinator in place, and I know we had some rumors and some things not confirmed, whatever, but as long as they have the right defensive coordinator in place, I think this defense has the potential to be a top three defense. Yeah, and that goes back to that conversation that's been ongoing now since midway point of the season when it started to look like perhaps Donovan Carter had a little more influence on that defense. And then, of course, the rumor that you shared that, mm-hmm. yeah, you correct, is, is yet, has yet to be confirmed, but we, we are fully confident of the sources we're getting that from. And uh, I don't know if you want to add a little more to that because whether there's something else to it, but of the possibility of Scott Brady going there. But... I think it's time to 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 dive into this piece as well. But and once again, there's probably more things like we should probably go through some of those other games from last season. I think the only proper Guelph game we've actually looked like looked at, ironically, was from two years ago with that Windsor game. Mm-hmm. But you know, if you've been tuning in over the last couple of years, I've been very down on my Guelph Griffins for a number of reasons. I won't totally get into all of them right here and now. And part of the reason that today, more so than ever, if you're tuning in on YouTube, maybe I'll share a clip of this. This seems like the type of thing I might we might clip out and share on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, so viewing this in some capacity, seeing me in the Yates Cup sweater, the Yates Cup ring, the Griffin hat, got the the jersey in the background, got two blankets, Guelph uh, swagged out to the T over here. The reason I'm so back and bought in, the reason I am arguably one might say once again going to the uh visual props here the reason i might be ride or die as you might say as i hold the t-shirt up to the screen that might you might be able to see that says ride or die is because of the individual on the other side of this hilarious t-shirt here tom who's this man riding in the go-kart (laughs) <laughs> that's incredible i've not seen that picture but that is One of my all-time favorite coaches. This is a rare instance where I had the chance and you had the chance. One, Mike McDonald is back as the offensive line coach for these Guelph Griffins. I don't know how this is playing out on the audio or the visual. (laughs) Needless to say, as two former offensive linemen, we are damn excited about this one. It's the return of the Mac. Coach McDonald back for in coaching for the offensive line for the Guelph Griffins. There's so many things we need to say about this. And like we talked about this before we started recording because, you know, at the end of the day, it's you and me on the microphone. We can say what we want to. Um, It doesn't really matter if we just want to talk about him coming back because we love him. We think he's a tremendous coach and he means so much to us. Are we doing this every time every other school uh, hires an offensive line coach? Definitely not. There's certain instances, though, where it matters. And this goes beyond the connection that we share. And I want to start by looking through some of those. One, he is the Yates Cup champion offensive line coach with 
the likes of of myself and when Matt Nesbitt was there, Kyle Frazier, Cam Wilhelm, Andrew Pickett, all these other guys that made that when Steve Marinumboy was there. And a big part of those names was he was out there recruiting his butt off. This guy, this guy recruits. He talked about the impact of if Scott Brady comes there as well, a star coach who also recruits. And hey, there's great recruiters all over the province on all these teams. But this is another great recruiter who can look at his own history with this program as a means of bringing in teams of showing this isn't just the past. I am here as a part of that, as a vestige of that golden age of Guelph Griffin football to now bring it back to its glory. So that's part one. I'm going to name off a few things and I'll let you jump in on this. The second thing, how do I want to approach this? So you mentioned Simon Shaves, the 2023-24 uh, Ted Wildman Award winner, Memorial Award winner. At the Wildman banquet, it's not just it's usually not just contemporary players and members of the staff. You get members of the community who are involved with the team, and you'll often get alumni from the program. Specifically, you'll get former Wildman Award winners who will come out to celebrate with the newest member of this hollowed class of individual, the one who represents all those great values of the Guelph Griffin program. And I'm certain that all these programs value those things, right? In Guelph, it's articulated in the form of the Ted Wildman Memorial Award. From my understanding, not just was Coach McDonald, as far as news from last night, all the different awards we're listing off, the return of Coach McDonald, there was only two former Wildman Award winners that went back to Guelph to celebrate in this moment with Simon Shaves. Now, is that does that say that Simon Shaves is a bad dude? No one wanted to celebrate with him? <laughs> Not even remotely. I think what it highlights more than anything, and you can look at my time as a Guelph alumni over the past couple of years, you've been following along as an example, although it, albeit just one, that there's been a bit of a not all alumni have been bought in. And a lot of it has to do with Ryan Sheehan. Like the way that he, in many, the way a lot of people consider that he pushed out Stu Lang from the program. This is a guy that told Stu Lang, he had to call him Coach Sheehan. And hey, I get it. Respect the head coach, but Stu Lang's of a different type of ilk when he's around anyone in Canadian football, but specifically around the Guelph Griffin program. And the way that he isolated other players and coaches, Mike McDonald being one, there are stories I've heard a plenty of a specific story that encountered that happened, I think, in the 2019 season, an interaction between him and Ryan Sheen on the sideline that not only, I think, in many ways, probably drove Coach McDonald away from the program for the time that he was, though he was always rooting for Guelph and always supporting the herd, as we've come to know in the offensive line group at Guelph. But push him label was the sort of the final straw of me being like, you, you, you pushed out my guy. I want nothing to do with this program. So all these various things, I think, come into effect when we now see Coach McDonald return m like weeks, within weeks of Coach Sheehan leaving with Mark Saria coming in at the helm as just not just bringing back a really great coach, a really great recruiter, but symbolic of hearkening to a much healthier time of Guelph Griffin football as a program in the wake of Coach Sheehan returning back out to Calgary. Yeah, I think that this team with Coach McDonald back on the staff says more about exactly like you were saying, the camaraderie and more about the atmosphere around this program than anything else. Um, Mike McDonald I really cannot say enough about this man, not only as a coach, as a human being, former R RCMP officer, just about doing things and doing them the right way, no matter how much hard work is invested and involved with that. Um, he was instrumental in my own up upbringing. He was my coach at the Burlington Stampeders for a number of years and really helped put me on the right path in terms of where I wanted to be from a football standpoint, but also how I wanted to conduct myself and how I wanted to move forward here. A man with those kinds of principles, despite his love for the Guelph Griffins here, wanted to make sure that, and I don't know this for sure, and like I'm not, I don't want to put things uh, words into his mouth by any means, but it does go into saying that he retired from coaching 
and within weeks, like you said, has now is now back with the Guelph Griffins helping out. It's it says something about the program that he was willing to come back, but it even goes to as much as it means to have him back. The offensive line study room is named after his parents. It's the McDonald O line room. Like he he is a part, literally a part of the building in that Griffin team. And even just going back a little bit further as well, um, when I a funny story when I was right after I had coached or during that time when I was coaching, I was wearing some uh, some Guelph gear and I took a picture, put it on Instagram. And a good friend of mine, Jordan Thompson, I also played with, hey, saw JT. it on Instagram. He's like, hey, why uh, why are you wearing that? And I go, oh, like I'm coaching for the, the Griffins this year. And he said, oh, wow. And he was, so, he was so excited about that. But the most important thing to me is that he didn't say, oh, welcome to, Bru- uh, to Guelph. He said, you're one of Stu Lang's boys now. And that goes to show the, the chemistry and the dynamic that Coach Lang brought when he was at that club without me even being a part of it. Obviously, he's your guy here. So to have Mark Saria come in and take back as uh, the head coach for the first time and already start to see some rumblings and some um, relation back to those years with some of the coaches that are coming back and the excitement around the program again. I can only imagine how excited you, my friend, are feeling with all of your Griffin gear back out of the closet that you haven't worn in a number of years. Yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of like at the end of like a Zelda game when you defeat Ganon or Ganondorf and then magically like the dark clouds clear and the, <laughs> the grass starts spouting. I'm being mean. Let's, but it's all, it's, it's, it's there. Hopefully we're articulating these points clearly because I don't think we're just being, well, we're certainly being biased, but I, I think we are sharing specific insights from our experience that I think are instructive in understanding why this is more than just any offensive line coach getting hired. When you look at the period that this team has gone through um, and no doubt for a number of reasons. But let's dive into last year a little bit more. Let's <laughs> actually talk, talk about football. Let's talk about football. Um, <laughs> last year, as you highlighted, a year that saw Guelph, and it's interesting where they finish in that two and, or probably that three and five situation tied with Waterloo. They lose to Waterloo. Quarterbacks injured left, right, and center. And at the end of the year, you know, we look at the standings where these teams stack up. Guelph just misses the playoffs. And you think it, you, your eye might naturally draw them to Waterloo as a comparison. Same record. Waterloo beat them in a tight game. Um, but my love for Waterloo just being what it is, which is is quite high, um, these teams are not in the same position. And when you look at Let's put it like this. When you look at how Guelph season went down and how Waterloo's went down, a couple of those wins for Waterloo, including that Guelph one, though Waterloo has always played Guelph well. Coach Burt has no love loss for the Guelph Griffins. He gets his team <laughs> ready to go for Guelph week. Absolutely. You look at a team, a game like that for Waterloo and you say, great win for Waterloo. And you say, bad loss for Guelph. You know, you look at Guelph, obviously, with the way they lost to Windsor and Laurier. Those teams, I think people would say, that maybe if the run game gets cleaned up again, actually, let's talk about that Laurier game because that offense was humming. It was once again that defense when, you know, Taylor Elgersmo was just running skelly. He was running just like, you know, 7v7 out there. Um, but then they drop that close game to Queens in the end, uh, near the end of the season, and then they lose a nail-biter to Carlton. Games that y- you got to have. You got to have for sure. Um, but on the whole, a team what which, once again, and looking at the standings, looking at the fact that Waterloo beat them, we might be naturally drawn to saying in these two pods, the Waterloo and Guelph pod are coming out in the same week. We might be drawn to say, hey, there's a certain similarity here. There, there really isn't. Going through the schedule last year, which of these games jump out to you the most as far as lessons, as far as how this team looks going to next year, how big a factor like the injury bug really shines in here, or some of those pieces about their defense being very shoddy at times. Mm-hmm. A um, couple games stand out to me in particular. First and foremost, I know that, you know, it maybe doesn't have the same uh, magic that it used to. And there's a lot of things going on with the team, whatever. But winning in Hamilton 
for the first time ever since Ron Joy Stadium has been built is an incredible achievement. You have had some unbelievable Griffin teams coming out of Guelph for the past few years, or back in our day at least, with all of the talent that we had on both of our teams here. And still, like that was that was something that was hanging over the program and hanging over the players for a long time. You have gotten rid of that curse. It's now done. <laughs> There's a lot of teams who have won at Ron Joy Stadium in the, cu- the past couple of years that I'm not exactly happy about, but that's <laughs> that's a big one. And you have guys stepping up in that moment. And I don't care how McMaster is and how, you know, they've got a lot of their own struggles, whatever else. Mac versus Guelph is always a tight game. I don't think I can ever remember a real blowout in any one of those. They're always grueling efforts going back and forth. And we traded blows a lot of the time. A lot of the time, the home team had their advantages going back and forth here. But to win in Ron Joyce in the manner that they did and to get that monkey off their back, I think is a massive victory for the Griffins this past year. And then the other one that I wanted to talk about was the Queens game Mm. going in and playing against Queens. And you and I have talked about how much we love this golden Gale team. And I will still keep calling them the golden Gales. Um, But with the, the defense that those Queens Gales have and the offensive capabilities. And obviously you see, you see the run game and whatever else. Now, obviously Queens had their own issues with injured quarterbacks and that for sure, but still to come within just seven points of this Queens team that I think was a lot better than they were on paper, I think goes to show how good this potential Guelph team was. And I love the, the, the heart that was there. And once again, they they finish with total offense of 294 yards. 205 of that for these Guelph Griffins come on the ground against mm. one of the best rush defenses in the OUA, in the Gales. I think that speaks volumes to where this team is, the grit that they have. Obviously, they, they ended up losing this one, but I was really impressed after I watched that game to see despite the injuries, despite everything else that's kind of been happening, they had that capability and they were only out of maybe a couple of games all year. And I think they had, they had a chance. Now, obviously they need to make that jump and whatever else, but still I was impressed by this Guelph Griffin team in those two games in particular. That Queens one, I pulled it up because I I remember watching it. It was a great battle. And really we've already talked about that Windsor game from 2022. This was that Windsor game of Mm -hmm. for 2023. And Actually, first off, it's just it still makes me laugh. Like, and I know what you mean, and I probably agree when you say that like Queens was a better team than they were on paper. This was a really good team on paper, too. Like, it's like I still don't really get Queens. I can't wait till we talk to people from their camp. And from the sounds of it, we might get someone really, really high up from their camp. So I'm really excited about that. But you look at the game, they got a boot, they got McCray in doing that two-headed monster, Malloy with the 144. And you know, this is where Queens is down to Russell Weir. They had all those uh, quarterback injuries. With Reekin at the top, um, but Kasari goes off with the 183. But then, as well, just to add in once again with just like how impressive this was, you put that aside, um, or you put the Russell Weir piece aside to it because at the end of the day, for this Queens team, they spend more of the time in the regular season with an unhealthy Alex Reekin than with him. And that's a big part of the story of the season and a big part of why when we talked to Nate and we talked about a bit of Queens in there, he's like, at the end of the day, like, if you get a healthy Vrikin for a whole season, like, you know, the sky is the, the sky is the ceiling or whatever for this team. Of course, they might lose Kasari. But defensively, it was the game that we saw the return of Silas Hubert. And he ends up with with two sacks in this game. And on top of that, you know, it, like it, it was just such a reminder to the league watching him just terrorize a really strong offensive line, mm-hmm. one that was banged up as well. But a team, an offensive line group that to some of the things we talked about earlier, going back to the Wildman conversation and Coach McDonald coming back, that is right in the prime of their careers with a guy coming back in that's going to, I think, help just galvanize that as as just one mighty group. But nonetheless, they're battling with Silas Hubert and just like he's making everyone look silly that whole game and times where he's pressuring a booed without getting home and as a result you have the result of a guy like Ashton Miller Melanson one of the best defensive backs in the whole province to begin with getting two picks as well and he probably intercepts quarterbacks better than anyone else so this kind of element of you know you're facing this stellar defense and they're either getting to you or they're applying that pressure and making you make mistakes you still come within a touchdown 
of tying this game at the end of it with the best running back in the country doing his thing on you, probably the best offensive line in the in the province at least for mm-hmm. Queens. Such a mighty performance. Um, yeah, I'm happy we got a chance to talk about that one because it really was, I think, that moment where we could say, you know what? This this Guelph team, and we saw in some other ones, you mentioned, you know, you kind of alluded to that Windsor and that Laurier game, and and we probably can't ignore those games, but you're certainly right. That Queens game, despite the loss and winning at Ron Joyce, were huge. What's let's talk a little bit about Windsor and Laurier though, because like mm-hmm. at the end of the day, all these things we're talking about, like someone can then look at it this whole thing and be like, hey, you guys have said some really great things. Happy for you, or maybe people aren't so happy for us with our support of <laughs> Guelph. Because you know, if there's one thing I've learned in the last like you know, ten years, almost ten years since I left Guelph, a lot of people don't like Guelph. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, can confidently say that they do not like Guelph. <laughs> you start winning a few games year after year, and guess what? Teams don't like you anymore. Mm-hmm. Boo hoo! We went seven and one all those years. Shout out to Mike Aloisio <laughs> correcting me when I said we were six and two on some of those Yates Cup runs. We were seven and one. God damn you, Nate Hobbs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but because here's the thing someone might hear us talking about all these things and be like yeah I get you that makes sense so you're saying that next year if they're healthy and these things are working out they should be competing with the westerns Laurier's Queens and um, uh, and and Windsor's of the world great they had a competitive game against Queens Windsor and Laurier ate their lunches like cool Queens you battled them with their third string quarterback mm-hmm. and you know um, like all these things going on in Guelph explain to me why anyone should have confidence in something we haven't seen because maybe both maybe Guelph will just come out next year and be like well don't believe us just watch and they'll play competitive games against Windsor and Laurier from where we sit here at the end of January in 2024 based on what we saw last year when Guelph played these teams how do you reconcile all these positive things we're saying with how someone might say well you're asking them to take a jump into the stratosphere of these teams these teams took them to task last year no, a hundred percent they did. And I think it's it's we we can't talk about these Guelph Griffins without talking about those two games in particular. And I'm really gonna focus in on the Windsor game because that to me really spelled the oh, this is where they're lacking. Yes, there's a lot of injuries going forward here. And yes, I think they had a few guys go down in this game as well. That speaks to that Windsor defense in particular and how well they were able to do here. But you look at how this team did. Now, Donovan Malloy kind of put the team on his back here. He rushes for 114 yards and a touchdown, and that's amazing. But you also have to take into account that one of those was the 75-yard rushing touchdown that he got there when he took off and just started going with it. Without that, he's got, what, 30, 40 yards, something something in those lines on eight attempts. You look at the passing on this Marshall McCray is their leader passer three for six 55 yards and he throws a pick Tristan Abood goes four for 11 for 36 yards this team this Windsor team really showcased to me how they what this was going to be like for Guelph where that defense we've already talked about Mufta Ageli and you, you know Claudia Moosin Maceo Christmas like all of those guys there unbelievable defense stacked up against the run and forced Guelph to try to beat them through the air. And these two guys just weren't ready for it. It was, I think, I believe it was the second or third game in the season. So these are two rookie quarterbacks going up against one of the best defenses in the OUA this past year. And they forced them into a scenario where like, you're not going to beat us in your run game. You might get a few here or there. Sure. But if you want to win this game, you have to do it in the air and they weren't ready for it. And that's really where this kind of comes down. And then you look over on the other side and we talked about in the later part of the year, you know, um, Windsor's offense kind of sputtering here, or there, whatever, Danny fricking skeleton, 18 for 21, 189 yards, two touchdowns, no picks goes off against this team. Wegby mumble nine, nine attempts, 130 yards. Joey Zorn, 12 attempts, 111 yards. Christopher John, 17 attempts for 81 yards and a touchdown. This was a Windsor explosion against these Guelph Griffins and really showcased that while there's a lot of talent and there's a lot of names on paper that we think could be all-stars, if you don't put it together on the field, that's the result that you kind of get. So that was my eye-opening experience when I was watching these Griffins this past year. No, great job by you. And just like, it's amazing. 
you know, we talk about how quick the OUA season goes, but at the same time, you mentioned that it's week two with Windsor coming into Guelph, picking up the win, or probably Windsor at home being Guelph. They pick up the, you know, <laughs> we're jumping ahead, I'm jumping ahead of the Windsor pod, but <laughs> they pick up that great win at Mac. If you're a, a Lancer fan, that win at Guelph, Danny Skelton's cooking that game in Waterloo that I was on the call with Adam McGuire in Waterloo, then picking up the win. Skelton looking amazing, then picking up that big win at Ottawa. And we're like halfway through the season and the conversation is, is Danny Skelton in the MVP conversation mm-hmm. or is he at least in that conversation for like third best quarterback once you get past Hillock and once you get past, um, once you get past Algersma, and then of course, as we kind of anticipated, well, you got a three-headed monster of Queens, Western, and Laurier in the latter part of your season. Um, so it's gonna be tough sledding from that regard. And uh, anyways, we're still talking about Guelph. Um, yeah. as a kind of as a funny little note, if you will, um, silver lining on the matchups they had with all three of those top defensive teams. Uh, they put up 21, of course, to Laurier's 60 in that loss. Um, you know what? For what it's worth, Laurier only gave up 18.1 uh, points per game. So you were three points over their average defensive holdup um, or uh, output, if you will. Uh, Windsor only gave up, I believe, 16 and a half. You scored 18. And Queens only gave up 15.3 and you scored 17 on them. So you know what? You broke the average for what these teams held these other clubs to in the OUA. So once again, that defense um, or that offense, I should say, looking kind of dandy in some of these performances against the top defenses. Um, We've talked about a lot here, Tom. One thing I just want to add some context to because I think I kind of blew past it. I just want to go back quickly and maybe this will help us now talk about going into next year, if there aren't more things we need to talk about, touch base on from last year, is this piece on McDonald coming back, the connectivity of, uh, you know, I think a big thing for Sheehan, probably for Saria, is going to be to to bring back the that feel of the alumni. Bill Brown does a great job of keeping the alumni connected and just, um, you know, bringing this sense of like the Griffins are back or, or whatever into the fold. And they do do a strong uh, job of that. But the point I raised about there only being two Wildman Award winners. I don't think I really made it drove home. Just like years past, like the five of them I got to go to, you went to a couple of them, and maybe things had already changed by the time you were there. There, like there would be Wildman Award winners from like you know dudes there with canes and oxygen tanks. You know what I mean? Like it meant something that like the Wildman uh, Award banquet was coming up, and if you were uh, the recipient part of that. Uh, elite class of Griffin history to have won that award. You were putting that on your calendar and you were coming out. So it was notable when I heard it was only, uh, I believe it was AJ Allen and I'm trying to remember who else. And AJ Allen is like one of the, you know, nicest guys anyone's ever going to meet. So he's not going to turn down coming out to the Wildman. You know, he's just too nice to do it. I believe it was Juwan Jeffrey um, Mm -hmm. who was also there. So just like, you know, very recent guys, really nice guys at that. So, I think that's a big task. And I think once that kind of builds up as well, the future ultimately is looking very bright for this team. Most definitely. And like something that I, I think I've detailed previously here, but want to hammer in again, I think that Guelph does their alumni, you know, keeping everybody a part of the program better than anybody else that I have really seen here. Now, obviously I've only really been a part of McMaster and been a part of Guelph, so maybe there are some other teams that also do things really well. But when you look at the social media presence, when you look at the game day, I think Guelph has the best game day experience you could ever go to with the, the parking lot right next to the, the stadium that's filled with food and with everything else from parents, from the Griffin parents group that are there just wanting to cook things up and make an exciting atmosphere for game day experience. If you haven't been out there yet, I highly encourage you to go watch a Guelph Griffin game because they are awesome. I wish that my own university would do more with the, uh, the alumni interaction and getting people to come back and getting people engaged again. You know, I think that there's, when you start talking about uh, honoring teams and whatever else, almost every game, I felt like there was another Griffin team from the past, whether they were a previous Yates cup champion or not coming in and uh, having a showcase and being honored at some of these games here. And I love that presence and to have that not only be accepted because Billy Brown is a huge proponent of that. He really runs that. And I think he does a fantastic job of doing all of that, but to have those alumni, not only just come, come around again, but then to really believe in the program and the the coaches that are there and things that is 
That's what you're aiming for. That's the reason why you're inviting the alumni back is so that they can see the direction of the team and where it's going. I think Coach Soria definitely has the capabilities to get that back on track and to get it back to the former days like you have seen with Coach Lang and how excited everybody is to be around the program and, and whatever else. So lots – that's the biggest thing, and as an overarching idea for Guelph for the past few years, is potential. This team has limitless potential on paper, but you need to bring it together. You need to bring it together and actually com- uh, convert this and compete and con- get that into wins. You know, it's it's a great thing to have the athletes that you do and to have the the capabilities, but if you finish next year as three and five again with all of the the people and pieces that you have in place here. Like that's such a disappointment because of the capabilities that you have once again here. So lots to be said about the potential of this team. And probably in my opinion, this is the best team that to have the biggest jump next season from where they finished to where they could end. But you gotta, you get, you have to do it on the field. Doesn't matter to former offensive linemen going back about how excited they are for a football team. Doesn't matter. Squat in the grand scheme of things, you have to go on the field and perform. So we'll see how well these Guelph Griffins can do, but the potential is there. Definitely. Uh, it, it almost makes me think back to, they're now entering that area of, there was a number of years in the late 2010s where Laurier just didn't cease to disappoint what I thought they could do going mm-hmm. into the regular season. And the top of the OUA just remained as it was for the bulk of that um, decade where it was, Western, Mac, and Guelph at the top there. Waterloo kind of flirting with some of those more um, efficient Trey Young, pardon me, Trey Ford uh, years in the mix there. Queen's starting to come back into prominence towards the latter part of the decade. But team where, and we're in a place now where I think it's it's Western and Laurier still firmly in that 1A. But I think there is... It might be a 1B situation. At what, we might be in that stage now when you look at Queens and you look at where Windsor's at right now. Obviously, there's going to be a few changes that we'll see and we'll detail those programs when we get to their exit meeting episodes and hopefully get to talk to some of the people that can give us some more insights. So I say all that in saying that with established teams as that team that's coming up and all that potential as you highlight, we still have to realize that there is a pretty solid top tier that it sometimes takes that year or two to break into. Maybe they still lose those games against the Windsors and the Laurier, and you better bet your bottom dollar they're going to have Western on their schedule because it's a damn shame whenever we don't get a Western and Guelph game, Mm -hmm. but you can be assured it doesn't happen often. So they're going to get at least probably three games against that mix of Western, Queens, Laurier, Windsor, Carlton, another team that I think you can make a pretty solid bet is going to make that jump. Ottawa is still going to be competitive. All these teams. So it's such a tough time to be making that jump. But the potential is there. And if it's not this year, we might see them still losing some of those games. But they're now in those 50-50 territories, much like they were with one of those teams in Queens, as we highlighted. Mm -hmm. But you kind of you, you give you give three of those top teams your best shot in the year and you only really give one of them a good look does that get to three good looks next year and maybe one win we shall see final words on the 2023 going to 2024 guelph griffins here on january 28th on the host wildman extravaganza <laughs> coach mike mcdonald back in the helm coaching up the offensive line under coach Saria, a team as you highlighted that in theory could return every single player a very young core on offense a terrific group of third and fourth year players to set that leadership set that mentality and really establish that hey you do not have time to mess around as a part of this team because we have let too many potential successful years slip through our hands because of just whatever reason final words about this team that is in an extra extraordinary exciting time in their program Mm -hmm. when you look at the potential we've said that many many times i've said that probably more than anything as well there's a lot to be excited for about this griffin team the injuries 
have to stop. It seems like they were a three or four year problem where their top players are continuously going down. You cannot continue to be successful if you're constantly dealing with those kinds of injuries. So whatever you have to do, whether it's changing up your practices, whether it's whatever, those have to stop or at least limit them as best as you can because it's football and people get injured. But when we talked about all of the different capabilities that they have on offense, the the weapons that they have, to now have, in our opinion, one of the greatest offensive line coaches come back to get that O-line that was mostly recruited by Coach McDonald, once again, get them back to form. Not to say that they had fallen off by any means, but really get them going as best as humanly possible here. I think you set this team up in a very good position to have him back and to have him in the room to add into not only the capabilities that they have on offense, but the culture around the team and the play that we will undoubtedly see at the offensive line level, I'm sure we'll be back to form from that regard. Keep you guys healthy and convert and get those touchdowns, turn them into points whenever you're in the red zone or at least in the win zone. I think that this team Yes, there's a lot of potential here. Yes, there's a lot of things that have kind of gone back and forth. There's been a couple of three and five years, and you're not playing up to that, whatever. If I'm a Guelph Griffin fan, I am very excited for this year upcoming. It's, yeah, it's a great time to be a, a Griffin fan. The one thing I, I realized came to mind when I heard about Coach McDonald returning, and I forgot to even ask you about, but I guess I'll do it right now. When Ryan left, I don't recall seeing, like, did Pat leave as well? And if not, he was coaching the offensive line. Is he, what's happening with Pat Sheehan? I don't know 100%. I've been trying to look into that, but I would assume if Coach McDonald is coming back, at least he is the uh, primary offensive line coach, or maybe Pat is the secondary. But I would most likely say if Ryan is gone, Pat is probably gone as well. That's kind of what I figured. Um, I didn't remember seeing any word about that. Obviously, at time of recording, there isn't an official word about the McDonald thing, at least nothing that I've seen. Um, word was that it got announced at the Wildman. So more exciting things to keep attuned to. As we said, a number of guys with this Guelph program to keep your eyes and ears peeled for as we approach March, April, and May into springtime with things like East-West with the CFL draft coming up because of that talent right in the prime of their careers, third and fourth year guys. And of course, it's when you have talent in those third and fourth year guys that you are uh, in an opportunity to take a shot to win a championship. Tom, excellent job as always. As I said, I'm so excited to be back uh, repping the red, gold, and black of the Guelph Griffins. And uh, I think it'll make next year that much more exciting for us when I'm not just a, uh, a heartless broadcaster breaking down these games, but I have a little more invested into it with the Guelph Griffins. That'll wrap it up for episode four of the exit meeting series. Next up, you will hear us talk about the team that tied with Guelph in the record book, but slid into the playoffs due to that late season week six matchup or week seven matchup, the Waterloo Warriors. So we'll be back to talk about them later on this week, right here at the 55.